Let's talk a little bit about Dussax. Hey folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatore. Now, some of you undoubtedly will be thinking, what on earth is a Dussac? And that's really what this video is, is it's an introduction to the topic, and it is inspired by one of my patrons on Patreon, link below, uh, by SRS Twist. Now, every now and again on um, Patreon, I invite my patrons to give me ideas for videos, questions they want answered, things they want me to revisit, things they want me to correct, whatever. Um, and I duck into those uh, responses every now and again and I pull one of those out. And this is the one that uh, came pretty much straight to me just now, uh, which is from SRS Twist, and uh, asked me to talk a little bit more about Dussax. Now, this isn't going to be a massive video on Dussax, it's going to be a light touch first introduction to the topic, because I realise that a lot of you out there will be wondering what on earth is that? And you've never heard of that before. Some of you, of course, will know exactly what a Dussac is, and so this might not be so interesting for you, or maybe it will be. Um, so, many of you will be familiar with one of these, that is a Langmesser. Okay, now, for those of you who are not, this is a type of uh, short sword, shortish sword, uh, that was used particularly in the 15th and 16th centuries in uh, late medieval and Renaissance Europe. Um, these first appear arguably at the end of the 14th, beginning of the 15th century. There's not an awful, there are some similar weapons that these maybe come from, but this kind of finished form, as it were, uh, comes around really in the 15th century. So it's a very much a late medieval and Renaissance sword. And these are commonly described as I won't say peasant weapons, because I think that's um, that's both a misnomer and misleading, uh, but they are, shall we say, common people's sidearms, okay? So these were carried in war, they were sometimes carried by knights or people wearing armour, men at arms, but they were perhaps more commonly worn by people who were travelling around, um, in either in town, if that was legally allowed in the town where you were, or travelling between cities, this kind of thing, in civilian life. So it is a civilian sidearm, okay? But, as with many civilian sidearms throughout history and throughout civilizations, they were also carried in war, and they were also used by soldiers like archers, billmen, crossbowmen, gunners, people like this, as well as, uh, occasionally, by armoured people. Now, the general trend, this is a very general trend, but the general trend is that those weapons are usually carried by civilians or more lightly armoured soldiers, and usually knights or more heavily armoured people carry things like arming swords and long swords. Not always the case, there's some overlap, but you get the idea. Now, this weapon of the 15th century, uh, this is a Lance Connect Emporium uh, version of the 15th century, probably late 15th century style, so about 1480s, that kind of time, uh, developed into a version, uh, what or should we say, was related to uh, later weapons like this. Now, this is actually related to a falchion more closely, so you'll notice that the construction of the hilt of this one, I'm not going to go into the details of messers versus falchions in this video, I've done ones in the past, search in my playlists, um, but you'll notice that this is a knife handle construction, slab grips, full width tang, and this is a sword uh, hilted version with a pommel, a grip, and a guard. Uh, now, falchions and um, langmesser, langmesser is a German word for long knife, um, falchions and langmesser incidentally are clearly interrelated to some degree. Uh, James Elmsley has probably done the leading research on single-edged swords in the medieval and renaissance periods. But basically just to say that we find similar types of blades on, on both types of hilts, and then these weapons hung around for really quite some time. Uh, in fact, we'll talk about that a little bit more in this video uh, because it's very relevant to this. And there were practice weapon versions of these, which commonly in HEMA get called Dussax, or Dussacken uh, sometimes in the German, and it comes from, seems to come from the Slavic, I believe, Bohemian uh, Czech word, um, Tessak. Okay, now this sword that I'm holding here, if this was in Italy, this would be known as a storta. If this was in um, if this was in England, it'd be known as a falchion or fauchon, uh, probably in France, um, or sometimes perhaps other words like uh, couteau, uh, um, which leads to the word cutlass, incidentally. So they can go by very uh, a variety a variety of names. However, one of those names is tessac, and uh, the related word to that is Dussac, the sort of Germanized version of um, of that word is Dussac. So, but in within Hema circles, a Dussac can be a sword 
or it's very often refers to a specialized training weapon. Now this type of training weapon, actually we see them in a whole bunch of different sources, obviously in fencing treatises, uh, Yucca Maya, Polisecta Maya, various others, um, Suta and a bunch of them, particularly German um, sources. But we also see them in general artwork as well. And this we know was the general practice weapon for one-handed cut and thrust swords, particularly for things that are akin to the falchion Storter, or indeed uh, later on, the, or earlier on rather, the Langmesser, so late versions of the Langmesser. So we actually explicitly have this written in 1570 by Joachim Meyer in his treatise. He says that the Dussac is the practice weapon for all one-handed swords. Now, it contradicts slightly there because he clearly has a different practice weapon for his so-called rapier. So actually, and his rapier looks more like a side sword. Don't worry about rapiers and side swords. That's outside the scope of this video. But for weapons like this that can cut and thrust, and they've got some quite decent uh, cutting capacity, especially for the later versions with hand protection, the Dussac is the practice version. Now, what was it made of? Um, how did they function? We don't really know. <laughs> um, so it's very likely that the majority of them were simply made of wood and they simply had a hole cut in them for the grip and the knuckle bow. It's also worth mentioning they have a knuckle bow on them at a time when lots of swords didn't have knuckle bows on them. So they actually have added hand protection, you could say for training purposes, despite the fact that we do also find um, knuckle protection and uh, sort of complex hand guards on swords in this period, increasingly so as well. But there are some theories that some of these Dussac weren't just plain wood, that some of them were made of a combination of wood and leather. There have even been some theories that they were perhaps sometimes made almost entirely of leather, uh, not necessarily soft leather, but it could have been um, heat treated, kerbuli type uh, leather, so that they can be used in sparring. So what we've got here is a specialised fencing weapon, uh, unlike the flexible feathers and flexible rapiers and foils that we see, wasters that we see, this is essentially a wooden waster or wood and leather waster that you can hit each other with to some extent without killing each other. So it's a specialised training weapon. Now Dussac, again, just to reiterate, can refer to a real sword. The word Tessac or Dussac can refer to a real sword. Or, more commonly, certainly in the modern world and certainly in HEMA, historical European medieval um, martial arts, um, it more often refers to the practice weapon version of that. Now to keep this brief but also draw this to a conclusion, I think a very, very important thing to point out about the Dussac as a practice weapon is that it's a very important missing link when we look at the methods of its use. So, for example, if we look at the styles, if we look at the techniques and repertoire that are associated in the fencing books with Langmesser, and then we look at the techniques that are shown in conjunction with uh, Dussac, we can see there's a bit of an evolution and a bit of a change. They are not exactly the same. The way that the Dussac is shown used in the 16th and 17th centuries is not exactly the same way as the uh, Langmesser is shown used in the 15th century. I won't go into the details of the differences, but there are differences. Now what's interesting particularly to me, despite the fact I'm interested in the Dussac and the Langmesser anyway, is to me, if you look at the evolution, I don't like that word, but if you, let's say development, if you look at the development of the fencing systems associated with the use of the Dussac, to me I can see a very clear um, trajectory or, or kind of line pointing towards a later fencing system which we talk about quite a lot on this channel which is the use of the sabre. So if we directly compare uh, sabre methods even if we look at the earliest sabre um, sort of manuals from the eight, late of, end of the 18th century, end of the 1700s, then indeed there's quite a big difference between the way a sabre is used and the way that a langmesser is used. Obviously there's some differences in the weapon, which you could explain some of those changes there, but there's also a development and evolution within fencing methodology as well. But the missing link for me, the almost exactly central point between the starting point of langmesser and the end point of sabre, is 
the method for Dussac. And there are so many similarities between the way that we see the Dussac used and the way that we see the Sabre used. But equally, we can also say that the similarities between the Dussac and the Langmesser. And I really think, uh, I mean, those people in HEMA, I, I'm not, probably not everybody involved in HEMA has ever thought about it in these terms. But if you're not involved in HEMA and studying historical fencing treatises, this might be completely new to you, new information. But I think there's a very defi definite um, sort of methodology development from Langmesser to Dussac to Sabre. And certainly in some countries via Backsword as well. I think there's some relationship there with Backsword as well. So I'm going to wrap it up there. That's my sort of brief introduction overview of Dussac. Dussac can be a sword or a training weapon. In the modern world, when people refer to Dussac, they're almost always referring to a wood or wood and leather training weapon. That training weapon was, according to Joachim Meyer, the practice weapon for all one-handed swords, even though there's a contradiction there because he had a different one for rapiers and side swords. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a good practice weapon akin to a weighty and short single stick maybe, in later centuries. And there's a definite connection between the earlier Lang... Uh, the, so this is the Dussac. There's definitely a connection between the earlier Langmesser and the later Sabre methods. So we do see some degree of continuation of ideas and development of ideas as the weapons evolved, as fencing evolved, as fencing methodology evolved, as the battlefield changed and things like this. I hope that has been a uh, useful introduction. Thanks again to my patron SRS Twist uh, for posting that question. Very good one, good opener to the topic and hopefully we'll be exploring Dussacs in greater, deal, uh, greater detail in the future. And if you want to see a little bit more, there's already a little bit more on my channel if you go and look at my video on pirate swords what type of swords did pirates use I actually talk about the early forms of so-called cutlass which actually are Dussax okay so go and have a look at that video as well thanks for watching give us a like and a subscribe and I'll see you back here um, on the channel really soon for another video cheers folks thanks for watching we've got extra videos on patreon please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already cheers folks